and get the coveted pre-launch spot, and we're maybe running behind, so I'll fly through this. Just kidding. Um, <laughs> and I hope I live up to all that was uh, in my abstract. Maybe we should have changed a little bit, but we'll touch on some of that. Um, but I'll be essentially giving a scatter shot of various bird conservation activities at Mass Audubon. Just as a brief little outline, I'll touch on um, the role of our sanctuaries in, in conservation. Um, I'll touch on some unique aspects of our version of the Foresters for the Birds program. Uh, and then I'll introduce a, an online decision support tool for creating young forest habitat. <clears throat> uh, so Mass Audubon is the largest private landowner in the state of Massachusetts. We own, I should say, 32,000 acres uh, spread across about 100 sanctuaries. Uh, we also hold about 8,000 acres in conservation restrictions. Um, many of our sanctuaries are on the small side of things, um, some of them being small coastal islands, uh, but they do get quite large, upwards of 1,000, 2,000 acres, especially as you move towards the west of the state and away from population centers. <clears throat> um, you'll notice that the sanctuaries are represented by dark blue, light blue, and blue outlines of triangles, and that they're relatively uniformly distributed across the state. Uh, which was initially done on purpose to ensure that our sanctuaries provide a platform for nature engagement, education, which of course plays an important role in bird conservation, albeit indirect. Um, a more direct approach begins with how we prioritize our land protection efforts. Uh, we don't as commonly establish new standalone sanctuaries nowadays, but rather work to acquire parcels that help to protect existing sanctuaries or expand upon them with an emphasis on protecting water resources uh, and establishing connectivity between sanctuaries and other, and other protected lands. <clears throat> um, so each sanctuary comes or has its own resource-based land protection plan developed. Um, that includes a map of the sanctuary and all the parcels surrounding the sanctuary. Um, and it shows the status of those parcels and prioritizes them for land protection efforts. Um, prioritization isn't necessarily done by considering a certain species or taxa, uh, but takes more of a habitat-based approach at the landscape scale. Um, so inputs that we consider are our state's Biomap 2 and UMass's Conservation Assessment and Prioritization System, which I'm informed by Bill DeLuca this morning. These are out of date and I should be using Nature's Network instead. <laughs> so I'm going to run back to our land protection staff and. I'll see what they say about that. Um, also consider our endangered species program to sort of, uh, these help us to identify things like forest cores, priority habitats, wetlands, vernal pools. Um, and so you can see here our whetstone wood sanctuary, our largest one at about 2,500 acres in blue. And the parcels, high priority shown in red, um, second priority in more orange, yellow, and so on and so forth. <clears throat> this is in a relatively heavily forested portion of the state, um, and a lot of the surrounding lands are, are protected as well. So our sanctuary fits in um, here, which really helps establish connectivity between about 75,000 acres of protected lands. Uh, the high priority parcels would be sort of, well, I can't really point, but down low where there's sort of no well, where it's unprotected, and we're, but protecting those parcels really helped to solidify that, that connectivity among this land. Uh, to put that into maybe a forest bird conservation perspective, such a large landscape could hopefully support robust populations of birds, um, maybe even help to support things like, like roughed grass, which might not do so well in fragmented landscapes. Um, oh, and I should mention we do consider, for example, the Nature Conservancy's critical linkages project that's also informing our land protection efforts as we think more about climate change and how distributions of birds and plants may, may shift. Um, moving to the southeast of the state where it's where there's higher development and continue they're continuing to experience higher rates of development. Um, we have two smaller sanctuaries uh, shown in blue here. And we recently acquired, oh, and we have that conservation restriction shown in the blue and white hashing. Uh, we recently did acquire those parcels shown in red, which really makes it a, a more realistic possibility of eventually connecting these lands in the future. Um, 
which may be particularly important, for example, to these area sensitive species. I need relatively large patches of forest within heli fragmented landscapes to, to find that higher quality habitat. <clears throat> As for um, on site sanctuary management, each sanctuary has its own ecological management report, as we call them. Used to be called EMRs, Tom. <laughs> um, which is really quite a comprehensive report that details all sorts of ecological features of the sanctuary, also identifies threats and opportunities. Um, and so most, oh, and, and so we also consider bird species of conservation concern as identified through, for example, our State of the Birds reports or our, our state, um, state Wildlife Action Plan and try to identify opportunities on sanctuaries for some habitat management. So far, a lot of that has revolved around creating young forest habitat, uh, as shown on the left at our Richardson Brook Sanctuary. Uh, this cut is approaching about a year old and is also um, in quite close proximity to a known New England cottontail population. <coughs> um, but however, with, with, um, with some poor, oh, and this was funded by Mass Wildlife Habitat Grant. Um, we also received support from National Fish and Wildlife Foundation to uh, begin creating this long-term, we call it a 100-year um, forestry demonstration site, which will include, uh, the first round of, of treatment will include about 100 acres of forest, of timber stand improvement to sort of help that understory, help the mid-story um, for more of the mature forest birds, and while also creating some young forest habitat. <clears throat> However, most of our sanctuaries aren't going to receive this sort of intensive treatment. And as well in Massachusetts, most of our forest is in this you know, non-industrial private family ownership. Uh, so with all that in mind, we worked with folks at Vermont Audubon uh, to create sort of our own version of the forest just for the birds program. Uh, our version is a bit unique in that we, we train consulting foresters to do the bird habitat uh, assessments and management plans, and then connect them with, with landowners who are interested in managing for bird habitat. Um, this may take a little bit longer to get up and going, but really helps to increase our capacity in the state. I'm the only person that works on this project for Audubon, uh, though it is in partnership with Department of Conservation and Recreation um, and our state foresters. Um, so the foresters go for, through this three-step training process where they attend sort of a day-long crash course on bird habitat. They then line up their first client, and I go out into the field with him just to sort of reinforce some of the concepts and bounce ideas around. They write that plan up and send it to me, and I review it. Uh, the third step would be to do that all on their own and then send me that plan as well to review. And then at that point, um, pun intended, they are fully fledged. And, um, but I tend to, I always let them know that if they have any questions or need maybe a little bit more one-on-one -on -one time, that definitely reach out. <clears throat> uh, and our state does provide cost share funding through our, our Working Forest Initiative um, to help get these plans written, uh, which really helps to sort of incentivize participation for both the landowners and the foresters. Uh, we have had some success. Uh, you can see a, a good increase in plans uh, over the past four fiscal years that the program has, has existed in our state. A similar trend shown in number of acres um, with plans based on f uh, forest cutting plans filed with the state. We're looking at estimating about 20% implementation and we're going to launch a monitoring program uh, in 2019. Um, I don't know if somebody else I believe maybe is covering this, so I'll only briefly mention that we're dealing with small ownership, small parcel sizes, which can uh, really limit uh, our ability to create these, what we might think of as ideal landscapes. Um, I will mention that the program Forest Sisters of the Birds has been featured, or is currently featured in one, was featured in one, and is in a second RCPP, and our CSRCPP program, which sort of dedicates funds to a geographically important area for management practices, in this case, uh, Forest Sisters of the Birds practices. <clears throat> um, I think that's all I wanted to say there. So I'll just quickly introduce uh, this online decision support tool for the creation of young forests with 
additional funding from National Fish and Wildlife Foundation. We partnered with uh, the Forest Service and UMass Amherst to create PACT, Predictor of Avian Communities Tool, which allows the user to draw a polygon on a, on a base map. <coughs> uh, the tool will then calculate a list or predict a list of bird species that will be that would occur in that uh, young forest treatment. It does this after considering regional occupancy, in other words, where you are in the state, uh, habitat occupancy, which is based on area occupancy relationships, how big the patch is of habitat. Those multiplied together would give you local occupancy. Um, the tool also will spit out a conservation value for that, for that management scenario. And that's based on that formula down there, which is essentially saying you take the local occupancy calculated above, multiply that by the partners in flight regional conservation score for that respective species, sum those all up to get a, a conservation value. Um, so just to back up a bit and go sort of behind the curtains, um, the list of candidate species for the tool was derived from um, this large New England-wide review of, of shrubland bird species by Schlossberg and King. Um, if you include only species that breed with, in Massachusetts um, and almost exclusively use young forest habitats, you end up with a list of 21 bird species. <clears throat> there are differences in uh, regional occupancy across the state as shown or demonstrated by our breeding bird atlas. However, these, reg these uh, regional occupancy probabilities were drawn from uh, the Forest Service's, the current distribution maps from the Climate Change Bird Atlas to get the re regional occupancy probabilities. Um, habitat occupancy at the, at the patch scale was um, derived from empirical data gathered in Massachusetts, published by Roberts and King. Again, looking at area occupancy, how big that patch is. Um, which helps to predict whether that bird would use the patch or not. Um, data from the published literature, as well as a little bit of expert opinion, was used to assign one of these functions to birds not included in the study. Uh, this same study also demonstrated that prairie warblers um, are more likely to use a small opening if it's in close proximity to a larger opening. <clears throat> uh, and that landscape consideration is also incorporated into the tool. Um, so just a quick little demonstration. Um, you draw that polygon in purple on the map and hit the analyze button on the top right there. And this table pops up showing a list of bird species predicted to occur in the patch, which is based on a local occupancy score of uh, greater than 0.5. And then it shows you that eight species are going to predicted to be there with a conservation value of uh, about 79. But then you realize, hey, wait, there's this really large patch of, of habitat nearby. Pretend that's larger for demonstrations purposes. <laughs> I didn't vouch that when I made these slides. Um, and large is defined as clear cuts greater than five hectares or a power line corridor wider than 50 meters. So the tool will let you um, measure, for example, the area of the patch and the distance to it, or the distance of the power line corridor. Um, and then you can input the distance in that little green box as being 270 meters away. Um, hit analyze again, and you'll see prairie warblers now included. Uh, the likely number of species increased to nine with a higher conservation value as well. Um, this is the current iteration of the tool as it stands. Uh, the team did recently complete a meta-analysis on um, the effects of retention in clear cuts on the densities of shrubland birds, which um, as of yesterday they're working on incorporating into the tool. So maybe in the future you can select um, treatment types as well, like seed tree or shelter wood. Um, and I believe we're also working on in incorporating time since, since treatment, as these birds are known to use young forest, you know, their, their use peaks at certain time periods. <clears throat> um, five minutes and I'm, I'm actually done, so. <laughs> uh, that's the website. It wasn't working yesterday because I know they're tinkering with it, pact.ecoshed.org. Um, that's, what, that's what I have. Thanks. <laughs> Do you have a couple minutes before uh, 
before we break for lunch. So any questions? Yeah. I'll be here anyways. So. Yeah, well, I, I'll, oh, um, well, I'll just, uh, I was kind of curious, I can't remember one of those maps of the sanctuary uh -huh. um, when you were trying to look at prioritizing connectivity. There also were like these really large patches kind of outside of your sanctuaries. I don't know if they were, you know, private or what, but. Yeah, I'm going ever, the wrong way. I was kind of wondering if you've ever thought about like land swaps. Have you ever thought your sanctuaries are sort of in the wrong, wrong places and maybe getting, you know, moving them to different areas or selling and swamping Yeah, um, very interesting idea. I don't know. I don't work with the land protection staff. In fact, I was interviewing them before I made this, <laughs> made this presentation, so I might not be able to answer all the, all those related questions, but cool idea. <clears throat> yeah. Quickly just to describe what the sanctuary mean, what's allowed on those properties? Sure. Um, what's allowed on that property? Let's see, I guess any um, bird watching, hiking, there are no dogs, no fires. Um, we're starting to allow controlled hunts on some properties for deer. Um, I'm sure other things are not allowed. <laughs> but generally speaking, all our properties are open to public visitation, uh, even if they're not generally prepared for that. Uh, that Whetstone Wood property, the big one I showed, which, well, my slides aren't even up there anymore, but that's okay. Um, that one is considered, I guess, like a wild land property, so it will never be uh, prepared for, visita for visitation, and, uh, I guess, discouraged for visitation. As the landowners wanted it, that gifted it to us. But generally, we try to accommodate the public as part of our model. How, how much of an issue is uh, over-browsing by deer on the sanctuaries in terms of getting the forest structure the way you'd like it? Um, I can't speak to any data we've collected or not, but some sanctuaries, I mean, you can see really clear browse line going straight through, um, particularly in the east of the state, um, which has more of that fragmented landscape with the patches of forest and ag areas and has limited hunter access. Our, our deer populations are really high. I mean, some estimates are maybe 90 per square per acre, is it, per square mile, where it should be down to like 10 or 20. Um, I'm sure we'll get into some of that conversation later as well. <laughs> Thanks very much. Sure.